G'day and welcome back to the second part of this course, the title of which is Counting to Learn Numbers. So we're going to, to talk about what counting is and how we can use counting to progress our students' understanding of numbers. Now I'll just point out at the beginning here that counting is most important at the beginning. So when the students are learning small numbers for small increments when we're doing number facts, we don't actually do much counting, you know, beyond 100 or something. So we can do it as an exercise. We do a little bit of counting of larger numbers, but most of the counting is done in the early years, which is why it's in this course. So let's look at the process of counting and think about what it actually means. So let me put some objects up here. Now, I'll zoom in on this on the, the video. How many objects are there? Just have a look at it go through the process, work out how many there are. Now, that's not a difficult task, but there's a number of steps in it. And I do this sort of thing with my students at university and it's, it surprises them, I think, at how complicated counting is. Because when I first say, put some objects on your desk, now count them, they look at me like I'm an idiot. I go, this is university, why are we counting, you know, pens on our desk? But what I need to illustrate is the steps involved in counting, the understanding that's behind it. So what it is that needs to happen in your student's understanding um, as they count. So I deliberately put up a fair number of these. If I put a smaller number, you could have seen how many there were without counting. And we're not dealing with that topic at this point, but I'll just mention it. You'll be familiar with it. It's called subitizing. I discovered the other day watching other YouTube videos that some people at least call it subitizing. Okay, I apologize if I've mixed anybody up. I call it subitizing. And that is simply looking at a group of objects and knowing how many there are without counting. So um, when I've gone through the explanation of what counting is, that, that may be clearer. So to count this many objects, because it was on the screen, if you if you're viewing this on an iPad or a computer screen, I suspect that you pointed at the objects. At the very least, your eye would have flicked, you know, from object to object to object. So we can do this with our arms folded and just go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. When you do that, you're looking at individual objects. There's no way of counting things without doing that. So to make it clear, let's just write it down. So let's say this is number one, this is number two, there's three, we'll call that four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I didn't know how many there were, I just put some up. There are ten altogether. Okay, what have we just done? We've been through the sequence of counting names, and in fact the symbols as well, because I've recorded this using the written numerals, from one to ten. We had to get that sequence correct, didn't we? We couldn't leave one out. So if we were to give this task to a child who didn't know the sequence really well, who made a mistake, who kept getting, I don't know, six, seven, eight mixed up, or left seven out for some reason, they wouldn't get the right answer. So that's the first thing, you have to know the sequence. Then you have to apply the sequence correctly to the objects. And by that we mean you have to have one number for each object and one object for every number. So we don't have another object without a number and we don't have a number on its own without an object. So it's what we call a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's an exact correspondence between the number of objects in the set, the numerosity as of the set, as I said in the last video, and the sequence of number names from one to ten, sorry, the sequence of numbers up to 10, and we're going to use the names, of course, from 1 to 10. And the last thing we do, and you will have heard me say it, although you may not have perhaps taken particular note of it, when we get to the end, we don't say there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 counters. We say there are 10 counters. So all we focus on at the very end is the last number that we reached, the last numeral that we used, and say that's how many there are, and we don't mean when we say there are 10 counters, we don't mean there's this one. That's number 10 in a sequence. We mean all of these in this set have the number, the numerosity of 10. That's called a cardinal 
number, a counting number, and that's a cardination principle. So technically, that's what we call it. But it's important to recognize that that's the last step to say this is the number in the entire set. I think you can see there's a fair bit of conceptual understanding going on. There's a procedure here, an almost mechanical procedure of, of as I said, applying each number to an individual unique object. And that can be done physically by pointing. That, of course, is why sometimes children and adults will actually touch things when they're counting, especially if they're afraid of losing count or missing one or something like that, because we have to make that um, correlation. But conceptually, we, we understand at the end of that process, it's not a, the sum total of pointing or the reciting of the names, but it's a concept that takes in the whole set. OK, so we don't want to go too, you know, we don't want to wax too philosophical, philosophical about this, but that is really what's going on when we're counting. Now, at this, we'll move on to the next slide, and we want to compare the idea of understanding numbers and merely reciting number names. So it's quite common with young children to ask, how far can you count? You know, can you count to 20? Can you count to 40? Can, you know, or some other milestone. 100 is a nice one. And children will, will be very proud of themselves when they can master the intricacies of the names of the numbers and get all the way to 100. And then usually they realize you can go beyond that and you can keep on going and then it gets boring because it's too long. But it's important to point out, as I'm sure you are aware already, that reciting the names is not the same as understanding the numbers. So in other words, being able to count, quote unquote, from 1 to 20 as a, you know, a, 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 a common first milestone, first step, doesn't mean you understand the numbers up to 20, it just means you know the sequence of names. So any sort of program that goes through the repetition of the names in a rote learning fashion is helping students to learn that sequence of names. It's a sequence of words. Just as being able to recite A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H is a rote learned sequence of names and nothing more, Knowing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up to 20 is the same thing. It's a, it's a rote learned sequence. There's a little bit of a pattern in the T numbers. We've got 14. We don't say 5, so there's no 5 T. But then we have 16, 17, 18. Nine. So those few have a bit of a pattern, but it's mostly rotely learned. And so for our students to understand what that means, if we say, let me move the counters so we're not distracted. Um, if we're to say to a student, um, show me the number 14, what does the number 14 look like? Why do we write a 1 and a 4? What does the 1 mean? What does the 4 mean? Those are investigating the number system and the student's understanding of the system. We shouldn't mistake the fact that they could count past 14 on the way to 20 for an understanding of what it means and of being able to use it in some sort of um, conceptual computational way such as 14 plus 2 equals what or you know 14 take away 4 equals 10 what does that mean how do you show that with materials those are all much more complicated questions so as I said in the notes we don't want to make mistake recit recitation recitation for understanding an unusual word I don't often use we want to ask our students non-standard challenging questions. I know you do this as an educator. We're always asking our students more questions to stretch their thinking, to stretch their understanding. And as I teach to my students at university level training to be teachers, sometimes you'll ask a question that is just for the brightest one or two students in the class. And there may be others who pick it up as well, but you really want to stretch the brightest and best academically gifted students in your class occasionally because they're coping with everything else they're getting all the answers right they're getting lots of kudos for getting the answers correct and so on but we want to stretch them further to maximize their learning so there are times when we want to ask difficult questions and do you know what it would be if we did this and how many would that be and you know there's just loads of opportunities for these questions in mathematics and as I've said last of all on this um, slide in the notes this is most important when we get to multi-digit numbers. So 
understanding the single digit numbers is relatively straightforward. We want them to associate the name of the number, the symbol, the written numeral symbol, numerical symbol, and the number itself or how many there are in a set that equals that number. We want them to associate those together and learn the sequence correctly. And so that's why we have charts on the wall in early years classrooms showing what number one looks like, number two, number three, and so on up to 10. And those are all important foundations. But once we get into multi-digit numbers, it becomes vastly more complicated. And it's really important to, you know, do a good job of, uh, of teaching that. Now I'm going to now move on to looking at counting as a uh, launch pad for number facts. And as I said early on in the first video, I recognize that early years um, mathematics curriculums, curriculums, curricula, don't include number facts for the very youngest of students. So in Australia, for example, it's not until year two, which is their third year of school after prep and year one, that students are expected to memorize any addition and subtraction number facts. So they're at school for two years and there's no memorization required. So you might make the assumption, therefore, that there's no need to teach anything all about, at all about addition number facts and subtraction number facts because they don't need to know it until they're in year two. That would be a mistake, in my view, because there's all this number work going on. There's all these representations and numbers and 10 frames and so on and so on and so on. Along the way, there's nothing stopping students from understanding some number facts and specifically moving on from counting. So that's what this is about. So here's the idea. And I'm going to put up a number line as a resource. So this is simply a resource that we can use for this process. And I'm just going to label this from 1 to 10. I normally start at 0, but it doesn't matter. We're, we're starting from 1 this time. This is a, a sequence of counting numbers, as we said before. It's a sequence of increasing value. Each of these has a representation that we could use with counters. So we could show that this is equal to this many counters. This is equal to this many and so on. So there's lots of different things that we can do with our students. As the students are learning this sequence and as they're associating them with numbers of objects, we can ask them some of these challenging questions I mentioned before along the way, such as, how many would I have if I started with six? If I have six objects here, how many will I have if I add one more? Can you tell what the number will be? So we're asking students to visualize and imagine and predict into the future. How many will there be if I add another one? And that's a great question for a young child who's learned the sequence of counting numbers and can probably count on from six in their head. So we're asking to stretch their thinking, their cognitive abilities, as I mentioned earlier. And so we can use this sequence to set our students up for understanding early basic addition number facts. And of course, we can count backwards and do early basic subtraction facts as well. Now, let me caution you that we should really only do plus one, plus two and plus three in the addition facts and minus one, minus two and minus three in the subtraction facts using a counting strategy. There's going to be another PD course available on addition and subtraction number fact strategies and I encourage you to, to find that and have a look at it. But at this point in the early years foundations, we're going to be able to help our students to use counting as a strategy for number facts, but I want you to stop at three. I know we could count more. I know we've got fingers they can count on. We can give them all number lines on their desk. We can say, look, count on further. How many is this if we add? We just want to keep the amount of counting to a minimum. The reason for that is later on when they are memorizing the facts and we're teaching them specific strategies, we don't want them to be counting all the time. A child who's counting on their fingers is doing a much slower process than they could do if they were to memorize something or count in their head quickly. So we're going to allow them, if you like, we're going to promote the idea of counting on one, two or three beyond the number that we're at. So the, the maximum that will go away from the starting number 
is three more places. So we could start at nine, for example, when the students are ready, and we could say, if you added another three to the nine, what would you get to? And we want the students to think in their head, okay, that's 10, 11, 12. 12 is the answer. Okay, so we want to discourage counting on fingers. We actually want to discourage counting on a number line, but it won't matter if all we use it for is small increments, short numbers of hops, if you like, so we're not adding too many, simply because there are other better strategies that are quicker. Ultimately, further down the track, when the students, that's an Australian expression, sorry, further on, as the students make progress in their education, they'll be using other strategies. They'll have to be adding numbers like 9 plus 5, and we don't want them to go 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We'd rather they used a process like, can you move one from the 5 to the 9, make that into 10, you'll have 4 over here, you know, and help them to visualise all that using 10 frames. That's for another course. So counting, as I said, is a, a launching platform or something like that for learning the early number facts, the beginning ones, and in the very early years, they're not memorizing them anyway. So we're not trying to ask them, can you remember what the answer is, but set them up with a strategy based on counting. Okay, so I've said this a couple of times, it's in on, on two slides in the notes, but let me just reiterate one last time. We want to restrict the amount of counting that students do because it's inefficient. And the other part of that, I mentioned counting on fingers, now we don't want students to count on fingers. The reason for discouraging counting on fingers, I mean, if they're going to count on anything, let me encourage you to get every student a number line like this and say, there, count on the number line. Because one day that number line won't be there. It won't be glued on their desk anymore. Or they won't have one available. And they'll have to think in their head and visualize, which is what everybody else does who, who is, you know, mathematically literate or numerate. But if you allow students to count on fingers, guess what? Barring accidents, they will have the fingers on their hand for the rest of their life and they could get into a habit of counting on fingers. So they're always doing this when they want to know the answer to a question. And if you needed any more convincing, I can give two um, anecdotes to illustrate this. One was in a year five class where students were learning about the perimeter uh, no, it was the area of rectangles, which is fairly complicated. It's a year five topic. They have to do some multiplication of the two numbers. And I watched children who could not only couldn't do the multiplication algorithm because they'd forgotten how, they didn't know how to add the numbers that they needed within the algorithm without using their fingers. So I watched a girl add eight and four using fingers. I was shocked and horrified. Now, you know, if you allow students to use fingers, that's up to you. You're a professional, you have to make professional decisions. It's not for me to tell you how to do your job. But if I can give you a recommendation in this PD course, don't let your students count on fingers because they won't stop. I believe they will not stop. They will keep going like this girl in year five. Presumably she started when she was five years old or earlier and she was allowed to count on her fingers and she never got over it. She was never pushed to do it without counting on fingers. The other anecdote, more seriously, a first year university student, I asked him a number fact, it was a multiplication fact, and he counted on his fingers under the desk. Now he wasn't counting individual ones, but he was doing a sequence of multiples. I think it was something like six times seven. And I saw him under his desk go six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, 42. And he literally counted the multiples on his fingers. And this was a grown adult of, you know, 18, 19 years old. So let enough of me telling you not to let your students count on their fingers. It's a really bad idea. Don't do it. Just as I said, small increments for preparation for um, number facts. Okay. Let's lastly look at number lines. Uh, we've already used one once. Number lines are a great resource for looking at sequences of numbers. I'm feeling bad for not having zero on here. I should have started with zero. So let's have a zero there as well. A number line is an excellent way of representing the sequence of numbers. And I'm saying numbers deliberately, the characters, the symbols and numerals, but the numbers themselves are in sequence, aren't they? The ideas that we're using. So this is illustrating and representing the sequence of numbers. 
and they're in a specific sequence that it's very ordered you can't rearrange them and so the number line is a, is a great representation of the sequence itself and then we can use it for stuff so we will use this for number facts and we're not talking about number facts now except to the extent I've mentioned it already but we can use it for other things we can use this for counting forwards and backwards for example as a nice early years topic can we count up to 10 of course can we count backwards from 10 can we use the number line for doing that can we look at part of the sequence now this is really important we want our students to be able to start somewhere and then count and of course you'll realize if you've taught young children for any length of time at all if you say start from six and count on some of them will find that very difficult we'll need to start back at zero and go, or from one at least one two three four five six seven eight nine ten we want them to be able to start at the six so what we really want in terms of their mental processing and really in terms of their memory is can you isolate part of the sequence and use a bit of the sequence that you've memorized very young children can't do it they're going to have to start from one every time as they get more um, advanced in their counting skills we want them to start in the middle so that's very important and counting backwards as well of course from any point in the sequence so we can use skip counting of course and that's in the notes uh, a really obvious skip counting is to, to count the even numbers 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 what's special about those numbers well we have this funny word even that we you know it's a mathematical term if we use 10 frames which are, this is in a separate course the 10 frames will show the even numbers beautifully as even rows or columns depending on which way around you've got it so you've got two counters then you have four counters and six counters and every time there's a nice neat array and two rows the same length they're even in length and those are the even numbers so there's a nice um, physical and pictorial way of representing what the even numbers are you know and the number line is useful for that of course we can do other sequences we can count by threes and fours and fives is a nice one because that gets us back to 10 and 15 and 20 and so on okay so to finish off the last point on the slide is that number lines are probably the second most useful resource um, after 10 frames so I'll I can't remember I'm probably going to talk more about 10 frames as we go through this course there is a separate course I've already done on 10 frames so I encourage you to have a look at that one 10 frames are the best resource bar none in my opinion there's just nothing comes close to it but number lines are a second best and I would use both so I'll <coughs> excuse me I'd use 10 frames for the sort of things that we've already talked about I don't want to keep repeating myself so let's stop this is the end of this video and I'll see you in the next one